inspiration. When you talk about inspiration, you know, the way I inspire people, first of all, is my work. Because it wasn't great work, I'm, I'm full of shit. And telling them that you have to be courageous to do innovative work. You can be cautious, or you can be creative, but there's no such thing as a cautious creative. My father came to this country in 1907 when he was 13 years old. Didn't have a job, didn't know the language, didn't even have any schooling when he was in Greece. By the time he was 20 years old, he had a florist. He was the best dressed man you ever saw in your life. Married another Greek immigrant. It was the American dream. I was lucky to be a son to two people like that. I mean, I, they taught me how to work. They taught me how to be good to people. They taught me how to be everything in life. When I was delivering flowers for my father, any time I went anywhere near the Whitney Museum or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I would sneak in for half an hour and I would immerse myself with all kinds of art. But from the time I was five, six years old, I, I have Greek books where I have drawings all over the books. Any chance I had, I would draw and get up every night of my life and draw for two and a half hours and then go back to sleep. I, I used to sleep five, four hours, or four hours a night all my life. You know? And I would get up and draw, you know. I was about to graduate in 1945. I was the school's artist. And there was an art teacher back then. One morning she came to me, she said, George, go to the high school of music and art, take a test, because that's where you're gonna go to high school. And uh, she was my first great mentor because she, recognized my, my talent. When I got to the high school of music and art, I had never done any designing as such. It was just drawing. The first class was uh, like an abstract design course in the sense that, uh, you know, you, you got a piece of paper, 18 by 24, and uh, you had pieces of paper you could cut out, and, and said, okay, today, uh, do a design of triangles any way you want to do it. And the next day, you know, do a design of um, uh, squares and circles and do a design of this and that. And after about six weeks, the teacher, Mr. Patterson, said, um, okay, here's an 18 by 24 sheet of paper. You will do a design on rectangles. And everybody went to work and everybody got, you know, new scissors and they're doing this. And, and I sat there with the 18 by 24 and I just looked out the window. And after an hour or so, and he starts picking up everybody's work and he comes up to mine. And I said, uh, uh, they went, we went to grab it. I said, hold it. And I wrote G. Lois in the corner of an 18 by 24 rectangle. Right? He didn't get it. He just took it like this and was still, you know. I remember saying, oh my God, it's, he, didn't, he didn't understand it. And the next morning, three or four teachers came up to me and said, George, what you did for Mr. Patterson was sensational. That was so incredible. So what I had, ta what I had taught myself, and it was the lesson of my life, it, and I created my own epiphany was, anytime you have, anytime there's an assignment to, to work on anything, uh, your answer has to be, uh, innovative, sh sh shocking, uh, yeah, mind-blowing. So I enrolled in uh, at Pratt Institute. Then I ran into my second incredible mentor, a great man, an instructor by the name of Herschel Levitt. After about three or four classes, he called me down to see him, and he said, why are you in school? I said, well, I'm trying to become a designer. And he said, oh. And he writes out the name of a, a phone number and a name of Reba Socius, and he sends me to Reba Socius, who was the second woman named in our director's Hall of Fame. She was a tough, wonderful woman. She the one got me, got me to understand typography. And after six, six months of work with Reba Socius, the, the Korean War was going on, and um, I got drafted, and they sent me to Korea. I got out of the Army. 
I don't know, I came back with a chip on my shoulder, I'm just ready to kick ass, you know. And uh, Reaper Associates wanted to be a partner. I, 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 I didn't want, she said, well, George, then what do you want to do? I said, I really want to work at CBS, CBS television. That was the beginning of the CBS I. She sent me to Lou Dorsman, who was a CBS radio, and I go in with the work I had done for Reba. He said, uh, hey, hey, kid, you know, you're good. You're really good. And he didn't have a job for me, but he said, let me call Bill Golden. He'll give me a job. Called up Bill, sent me over to Bill Golden two blocks away. He looks at my work, he hires me. And Lou Dawson became, you know, I, I can't say he was my father, but he was father-like to me. And mentored me and watched me all the way through my career. So I get a recognition for an ad for Gunsmoke. And I, you know, they have a photography studio of, of, of CBS photographs, and I found a photograph of a, of a guy a, a drawing his weapon, you know, a cowboy, and another one from behind of a, a, a guy like this. And I placed it so that legs spread and, and threw his legs, there's a guy drawing on him, and I did it. And I, um, I went to a secretary and I said, I'd like to see, see Mr. Golden. And I show it to him and he says, that's, that's terrific. I'm gonna call the producers and they should, they should do an opening like the, of the show like this. Terrific, George. And there couldn't be nobody better in the world than Viva Socius, Bill Golden, and then the next great person I worked for, Herb Lubalin, you know, who I loved like a brother. And then Bill Burnback. People don't really understand the history of Doyle Dane Burnback and the creation of the first creative agency. Bill Burnback had this epiphany, and the epiphany was, hey, if a copywriter work with a terrific art director, even who been advertising, you know. The respect Bill gave to art directors was unbelievable. Uh, when I was there, and it wasn't there long, but I gotta tell you, it was magical. Bob Gage, Bill Taubin, uh, Helmut Krohn, and me in a row. It murder is wrong. I mean, I said that with the four greatest art directors ever in the business, working together next to each other. I mean, I was so thrilled working with three guys like that. Bill was a great, great creative director that inspired everybody, you know? When I left Doyle Dane Burnback, crazily, Bill Burnback said to me, George, please come back when you fail, you know? <laughs> And you know, we started, we started Pat Kane Lois in the first week of 1960, and we were hotter than Doyle Dane in a couple of months later. Starting that second creative agency was the spark of the creative revolution. Was out of our agency came Carl Alley, Scally and McCabe, and Sloves came out of our agency. Dick Rich came out of our agency and joined with Mary Wells. And maybe those four or five agencies did uh, maybe 0.1% of all of advertising in America, but that was the advertising people were talking about. Of course, remember, there's an inherent beauty in soup cans that Michelangelo could not have imagined existed. Talkative Andy Warhol and Gabby Sonny Liston always fly Braniff. They like our girls, they like our food, they like our style, and they like to be on time. Thanks for flying Braniff, fellas. When you got it, flaunt it. Braniff International, when you got it, want it. So we had successes, really big, fast, hot successes. Boom, 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 boom. America, demand your MTV! I want my MTV! I want my MTV. I want my MTV! MTV? Of course, everybody was talking about those. Did you see that commercial? Everybody was watching the same thing. Everybody was watching it, and you would become, you were part of the culture, so much a part of the culture. You gotta understand something. To this day, people say, I mean, the recognition of us, the covers, et cetera, just get bigger and bigger, you know? But people say, boy, you know, 
You had some pale ball doing these covers. I said, no, I didn't. It was Harold Hayes. I get a call from him, and I didn't know who he was. I mean, I knew he was the editor of Esquire. I said, can we have lunch? And I thought he was really looking for my agency to take advertising space or something. And he said, I wonder if you could help me. I said, sure. I wonder if you could help me figure out how to do better uh, magazine covers. He said, well, how would I do it? He said, well, you got to go outside and get somebody to, who, a great, a great graphic designer. And he said, wait a minute, pal, wait a minute. You gotta do me one cover. I said, okay, I'll do you one cover. I sent it to him, and I'm not hearing from him. And finally, I get a phone call at three in the afternoon, and he said, George, I never saw a magazine cover like this in my life. I said, no shit. W what my covers did is it said, holy shit, this is a magazine. It got people to really read it and circulate. Well, the one that, uh, the early, uh, St. Sebastian, I mean, I can't get away from it. It's the most important cover because I think it was a game changer. Because Dr. King had made a deal with LBJ that he was not gonna come out against the war in any way, shape, or form. And he saw that cover and he said, that's enough. And, the, and two days later he came out and he, and, he did, and he said things about the war that Ali never said. The promises of the great society have been shot down on the battlefield of Vietnam. It changed one of the anti-war movement. And that's why when people say today, why can't there be George Lois covers? Because there's no Tyrell Hayes. It, it, there would never have been Esquire covers, the my Esquire covers in one him. You can and, and that period was was called and is called the uh, golden age of journalism. My wife, Rosemary, I mean, I, you know, I, everything I've ever done, I show it to her, or sometimes I say, what do you think of this? And sometimes she says, she gives me a copy line. You know, I mean, she's, she's into it. I had a woman who didn't bust my balls about working late, but she understood the work was meaningful and wasn't just advertising, it was, changing the culture.